So this speech is kind of funny because they they um, they wrote my title and they wrote my description and they um, and I didn't even see the description until today and I was like happy to see it match the talk that I put together. So, but it was it was based on um, on a blog that I've been doing. I'm sort of the world's worst blogger. Um, I have two entries in my blog now after two years of effort. So. Um, but it's about, uh, it's about working on these old arcade machines. So it, has anybody here seen my blog, edfreeze.wordpress.com? OK. So for people who've read it, I'm going to go through a lot of the same stuff. There is some new stuff, but um, that's a lot of what this talk is about. So I'm sorry, I'm sorry in advance. And then there's, there's, there are two stories, which is yeah, computer space and then, uh, and then gotcha. And I'm going to cover both, hopefully. So um, I better get to work. Uh, Talk about me real quick. I'm really a software guy. Um, I, 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 I guess I'm retro by the fact of just being old, right? So uh, I was there. I was there at the time, right? When it wasn't retro. I started programming the Atari uh, 800 when I was a kid in high school, and uh, I just started uh, imitating games that I saw in the arcade. So I'd have something to program. I started first in BASIC and assembly language. And I made a Frogger game, and somehow it made its way through bullet boards down to a California. And somebody at a company there called Romox saw it, and they contacted me. I was a high school kid working in a pizza place, and they hired me to uh, write games for them, which was like a dream come true. Um, so uh, my Frogger game became Princess and Frog. I went off to college to get my computer science degree, and I did Ant Eater and Sea Chase through 1984. And then something happened in 84, and everybody went out of business, including Romox. And uh, I had to get a real job. Um, and so I uh, applied to a little company uh, in Seattle called Microsoft. And they hired me as an intern. I worked there summer of 85. Um, and then in 1986, they hired me full time when I graduated college. Um, and I was the seventh programmer to join the team making the first version of Excel for Windows. And I worked uh, as a programmer on Excel for five years, kind of worked my way up. Uh, became the lead programmer on the project. Um, and then my boss moved over to Word, and he said, I should come over to Word. So I came over to Word, and then I was a development manager, and I'm managing 60 people, and did a bunch of versions of Word. And I've been at Microsoft 10 years, and they said, oh, the next thing up for you is you should run a business. We think maybe you should go run the PowerPoint business. And I said, actually, what I really like is games. See, when I'm not here at work programming for you, I'm home playing games. And uh, they told me I was committing career suicide, and why would you leave office, one of the most important parts of the company, to go work on something no one cares about. Uh, but I didn't listen to them. I went and started Microsoft's game studios and grew our game business through a series of acquisitions and, and product releases. Um, and then these crazy guys approached me and wanted to do this Xbox thing, and so we got together and did Xbox, and that was all great. And really fun. I'd been in Microsoft 18 years. And uh, anyway, I, I just did this thing called um, Unfiltered on IGN. I did a long interview about this that I don't want to go over again. So go watch that on YouTube if you, if you want to know about that time. But anyway, but uh, I, I retired in 2004, um, uh, had some free time. I uh, started working as a board member or advisor uh, for other companies. And that's basically what I do today. I work as a board member or advisor. But I'm a, like a hands-on, like make it, fix it kind of guy. And it drives me crazy if all I'm doing is giving advice to people. Um, I mean, it's fun because I stay connected with young entrepreneurs and see the cool work they're doing. But I have to be hands-on. So I started this 3D printing company in 2007. Um, 2009, I, I found out about this book, Racing the Beam, and uh, it's fantastic if you've never heard of it. It's about the uh, Atari 2600. And so I read this book, and it really reminded me nostalgically of my time working on the Atari 800. But this machine seems so much worse than the 800. It, it only has 128 bytes of RAM and has no frame buffer. The sprites are a single byte. And if you don't change it every line, the, you don't draw something on the screen. So anyway, just the book seemed like a challenge to me. So, oh, I want to make something on this machine. So I couldn't, you know, one of the one of the games that we released out of my group was uh, was Halo for the for the Xbox. And so I was like, okay, I'll make a little Master Chief and try and draw him on the screen. And and that turned into this game, Halo 2600. Um, 
And uh, that's, I've spoken about this game here before. I released it in 2010 uh, with Al Yarusa from Atari Age. And, uh, you know, there's 64 rooms to fight your way through. It's written in 4K and assembly language, just like it was done in the old days. And uh, it's, it's uh, if I can say, I think it's really fun, hard. It's really hard to get through to the final boss. Um, but anyway, so worked on the 2600. That was really fun for me. I, I did some other projects on the 2600, um, including a, I wrote a Rally X because nobody had done a decent Rally X, which you can see out on the show floor. Um, but about that same time, I was I got some space, <laughs> and I was like, oh, I always if I had some space, I would want some pinball machines. And so I started to get a few pinball machines, and like pinball machines, they started to break, you know, and I was fixing them. And my dad is an electrical engineer. My brother's an electrical engineer. Um, I'm a computer guy, but but we always had you know soldering irons and resistors and stuff around the house. And so I at least you know knew the basics of how to solder stuff together. Um, but anyway, the pinball machines kind of led me to what, what arcade machine would I want if I could have one. And um, because I had sort of been going back in time through Atari history, you know, the very beginning is this machine, computer space. And so um, one came up on eBay one day and I just had to buy it. <laughs> so, so I bought this machine, it's a, it's a beautiful yellow computer space, and um, anyway, wrote a long story about fixing it, even longer than this talk. And uh, I encourage you, if you like what you hear in this talk, to go and, and read it, because it has a lot more details. But I'm going to cover kind of the basics of it. So anyway, that's the picture that was on, uh, on eBay. It said uh, that it has a broken monitor. Um, I'm like, OK, maybe I can fix a broken monitor. Um, anyway, it showed up, and um, <laughs> it was really rusty. The whole thing was rusted out. Um, and uh, I was kind of wondering what I got myself into. I mean, it didn't work at all, although you can see some of the tubes are glowing. Um, but see, my dad, when he was in, in college, he was a TV repairman. So I, I was like, I'll get my dad over. He can help me fix it. So he brought his tube tester over. He was excited. This is a, kind of at the end of the tube TV era. And um, he starts to look at it, and the tubes have too many pins to fit in his tube tester. He was like, well, this is way too new for me. Because <laughs> you know, he fixed TVs in the 50s. This was in the 70s. This was like, so OK, that wasn't a, too much help. But it, it, he really suspected this high voltage regulator, which is the thing you see on the, the far right side of the screen there. Um, and, and you might notice it's not glowing. Um, so I started to play with that after he left, and it, it pretty much crumbled in my hands. And then, then the thing it's connected to is called the flyback, and that crumbled in my hands. And, and I realized that I, I really had a problem. The good thing is, I had been reading online on Clove and some of the other things, and somebody had written a little bit about um, fixing a multiplayer uh, computer space. And that uses a slightly newer TV, something called, a, a, this is called an S3 chassis. And the, uh, the multiplayer computer space, the two-player computer space, has an S F chassis. So anyway, um, a TV came up on eBay around the same time I bought this. So I'm like, OK, I'm going to buy that too. I buy that, so I have a backup. That's great. So the TV gets home, and a couple things. One, it's a 12-inch, not a 15-inch, which was not uh, what I wanted. But the other thing is it was broken in shipping. They broke the back right off the picture tube. Okay. So I'm sitting there staring really depressed. I have, I have the TV on the left that's uh, got a broken picture tube. It's a wrong size picture tube. But the motherboard looks pretty good. And I got the TV on the right, which is presumably has a working tube. But the motherboard is trashed. You know, so hey, maybe I can take the motherboard off one and put it on the TV on the other. I'd never done anything like that before. I'm not a hardware guy at all. I'm a software guy. but. I'm like, you know, they're both broken. What do I have to lose, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, I just start cutting wires. And you see the wires are all colored, you know? So as long as I just, like, cut the wires off the one and I hook the red wires on one side to the red wire on the other and the yellow wire on one third. I mean, this, this is really in the beginning when I was starting to do this. I really didn't know what I was doing. But I thought, you know, what do I have to lose? So, um, so <laughs> I, this is me in the process of cutting the wires and reconnecting them. Um, you have to do more than that, though, because and, and what what they did with these TVs in the old days is they 
they wanted them to act like a monitor, not like a, a television. So they, they didn't build an, what's called an RF modulator to then go through the tuner and then, you know, turn that into a signal to the monitor. Instead, they, they tap the video and audio signal straight into the board. Okay? And I only had this really sketchy thing from this guy online about where to put those connections on the SF monitor, um, on the SF motherboard. But anyway, I did it. I, I put him in. I think I did, did it right. The thing he said was ground was clearly not ground, but you know, I think, okay, he's just getting his colors confused. Anyway, so I put it all back together, um, and it looks like that. <laughs> and it was kind of depressing, because that's it hooked to computer space. I'm like, oh man, this is so bad. This is going to be really hard. And then, I, and then I played with it, and I fiddled with it, and after just messing with vertical and horizontal hold for a long time, I got it to look like this. And now I was getting excited. I was like, okay, well, kind of. I mean, it still doesn't look at all like a video game, but, but I, I sent a picture of this to my dad. He's like, oh, this is promising. <laughs> you know, so I come in one morning, and, and um, you'll see in a minute all the, all the boards. It has, it has three boards all in a cage, and I'm just like, I wonder, and I just like push down on all three of the boards on, in the cage on computer space, and it looks like this. And I was like, whoa, this is so exciting. Um, <laughs> and so I was excited for like two minutes, and then I realized it's not supposed to look like that. I mean, it's got the stars, which is good, and it's got the score, but there's supposed to be these little saucers that are moving around and all this other stuff. So that was sort of the start of, of, of going into the big adventure to do this. Um, next thing, uh, I had to dig into the schematics. Um, all I had were schematics like this. I didn't have any documentation explaining what they were. Or what All I had is what you see there, and the schematics are kind of not great for this. This was the first, I should have said that at the beginning, this was the very first coin-op video game in the world. The very first one. It was created by Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney. They were, it was a dream Nolan had when he was working at Ampex. And his office mate was Ted, this guy named Ted Dabney, who doesn't get any of the credit that he really deserves. Um, but Ted was actually the skilled engineer. Nolan was like the dreamer with the idea. And they really needed both those together to make it happen. And anyway, Nolan, so if you read my blog, I try to mix a lot of like the me going through and all the pain of me trying to fix this with the history. So there's a bunch of history in there. But um, anyway, they end up teaming up to make this game. Nolan, through his dentist, meets this guy who runs a game company called Nutting Associates, which is a total coincidence. And Nutting ends up putting this game out. But anyway, so I'm trying to figure out what to do. I'm, I'm trying to understand these schematics, and I need some tools to do it. I've got some basic tools. The, the one on the left is probably the, the beginning, the most important one. Uh, upper left is a logic probe. It tells you whether things are high or low. Um, these, these machines don't have a computer. They just have little chips, that logic chips, that say and and or and not, basically. And through that, they create a set of signals that make a video game. And so you can use this little pen to see whether signals are high or low. And so I found where in the schematics the saucer was supposed to be generated. I followed it through with the logic probe until I found a spot where the signal didn't go through. Great. All I have to do is, that chip is wrong. That chip is bad. I'm going to pull that chip. Well, then how do you pull a chip? I've never done that before. You know? So I'm like, I, 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 I have the thing in the lower left, which is the solder sucker. And some people probably have used one of these before. They're terrible. It's <laughs> really bad. You know, and I tried to unsolder each of the pins and then suck the solder out because I didn't know any better. And, um, and uh, it's really hard to get enough solder off when you've got a, uh, something soldered in that has 14 connections or 16 connections to the board to be able to get the chip out. And I'm talking, and so I go up to my brothers that night for a thing, and he, you know, I'm like, I'm telling him about this. He's like, just cut the pins off, you dummy. You know, I'm like, oh yeah, the chip's bad. I can just cut the pins off. So you know, but I don't even have the right, the right kind of things to cut the pins, so, but I get it, and you know, I snip the pins off. But anyway, then I find out, oh, it's actually a good tool for this. It's, it's, it's called a desoldering iron, and I get one from this company called Hako. You can buy them on Amazon, and I, I super highly recommend this 
item, it's awesome. You just put it on a pin and you squeeze the trigger. It has a little vacuum pump in it and it sucks the solder right out. And it's just like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so great, so great. Uh, so, so, you know, getting the right tools really helps. Uh, I got my saucers up and then, um, and then there were still a million other things wrong with it. And uh, one of the cool things about this machine is uh, this was done before there were ROMs. And um, so, you, so if they wanted to draw like the spaceship on the screen, they actually did it in diodes, in a matrix of diodes that you can see on the board. So there's the schematic board and up above, you can see the actual diodes on the board. And those are the rotations of the ship. Uh, so it's kind of cool, like if one of the, one of the parts of the bitmap is wrong, you know, okay, this diode's bad, I just have to replace this diode. You can physically see it. Somebody said that TTL games are hard to fix. I actually think they're easier to fix now than like, if a computer's running on there, stuff is going so fast, it's changing, you know, at least you could just like follow it along with your Logic Pro. It's so easy. <laughs> so, well, I think you can use more advanced equipment to debug. Yeah, see, which I don't have that. I don't have any of that stuff. I, I need that stuff. You know, logic, logic Pro is what the cavemen use to debug fire. <laughs> <laughs> but this is like fire. This yeah. is like the right tool for the job. Yes. Uh, anyway, one of the things that wouldn't work on it was if you push thrust and it wouldn't go. And I talk a lot about this in the blog. But I, I really want to talk about my next thing, so I'm going to move on. But um, you know, this is the cage of the three boards that make up the, make up the machine. Um, which is kind of annoying because it's easy to debug the outermost one, but if you're trying to debug the middle one or the back one, it's, it's a problem. Uh, at one point I had to like hang the front one down so I could have debug the middle one while I had the front one still connected. Um, but anyway, I made progress. I slowly replaced chips. Most of the chips I replaced were the correct chips. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes I took out a, a chip that was actually working and didn't get better when I put in a new chip. Um, uh, I learned a lot about the schematics and how they worked. Uh, and the biggest problem I had at the end was trying to get the sound to work. And I couldn't get the sound to work and I didn't understand why. I tried a bunch of things, I spent a bunch of time debugging, and I had this self, kind of self-imposed deadline coming up that I had to be done with this by a certain time because I was going to have a bunch of people over for this party and I could not get the sound to work. Finally, I, I, I hook it up to a little pair of uh, iPhone ear, earphones, and I hear that the sound is good coming out of the board, but it's not coming out of the TV. And I don't know why. I, 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 back when I connected those wires to the TV, I was sure I did everything right, but I had very sketchy instructions. I didn't know why. In the story, I, I finish up saying, you know, I was out of time. I built this little audio amplifier from a kit, you know, uh, and just hook the audio signals through that, and the audio is great, but, you know, in my mind, ah, I really cheated. <laughs> it really wasn't good. And that's where the story ends that's online. Uh, you know, now, I'll, I just a, and, and the game looks great, and it works great, and, uh, but, you know, if, you're, if you've worked on these, you know, there's just, like, there's something itching at you that you just know you did something not right or whatever, right? So anyway, uh, a couple months ago, I was, uh, this TV came up for sale on, uh, on eBay. It's the actual S3. I've been waiting more than a year for an S3 chassis to come. The last one that came up, John from John's Arcade, and I battled over it. <laughs> and I'm actually on an episode of his where he's telling me he's going to outbid me on this thing. I was going to say, we've probably been bidding against each other, too, because I don't do these TVs. <laughs> but anyway, uh, this one I won, however. I got, I got the TV, um, and... Um, it has a few problems there in that, in that picture, but I was able to fix those. Oh, but see, the key thing that I learned was somebody, after I put my blog up, somebody goes on and says, hey, did you ever notice that if you look at that S3 chassis that you took out, there's some traces cut on the back of it? I was like, no, I had no idea. And so not only were you supposed to solder some wires in, but there's two places where you're supposed to cut traces on the back of the board. Uh, it's kind of hard to see here, but one is under where that resistor is, and the other one you can kind of see um, right up by that yellow wire. But anyway, that's why the audio wouldn't work, because there was still audio coming in from the tuner, and it was, it was supposed to be cut off, and then my new audio was supposed to be piped in. 
So anyway, I, I've got a new TV. It's all working great. I tested it on a Pong. It not only looks good, it sounds good, and I just have to stick it back in my, my computer space, which I haven't done yet. So that's a project waiting. Okay, <laughs> but that's the end of the fixing computer space. Now I want to talk about fixing color gotcha. So, I mean, what I learned from all this was that it's actually really fun to work on these machines. Uh, it was super, super gratifying. People say computer space isn't fun. It doesn't matter. I had so much fun fixing it. <laughs> um, that, that, you know, and it's, it's awesome to have it sitting there uh, in the arcade. Um, and so I was kind of looking for more of that sort of, you know, fun. And I was like, well, maybe I can just work my way forward through history, right? So 1971, Nolan and Ted through Nutting Associates put out computer space. 1972, they start a company called Atari. Uh, they hired their first engineer, a guy named Al Alcorn, and he creates Pong. And so I got a Pong PCB and uh, it's really fun to see the old Pongs as a GD PCB. Uh, and uh, if you watch, you can find these sometimes on eBay, and they're, they're not that expensive. It just kind of, to me, this is like the very first video games of all time. It's like people are out there paying sometimes hundreds or thousands of dollars for some rare NES cartridge when these are so much rarer and so much more early. I don't know, but anyway, so whatever. Um, so I get the Pong, I hook it up, and it works. I was like, damn, it worked first time. I didn't have, I didn't have anything to fix. It was like, that was no fun. So the next game that Atari made was Space Race. So uh, I'm hunting around, a Space Race board comes up, I buy it. Uh, again, it's really cool, the thing in the red circle there is the, um, the ROMs making the, the spaceship that you see here. Um, so Space Race is the, the second game from Atari. It's, you could argue, the first racing game, because you're racing from the bottom to the top, also done by Al Alcorn. Um, and what was cool about this is it did have a few problems. <laughs> it had some problems in the sync circuit, um, and, and it had like a jumper wire just hanging off in space that I had to figure out <laughs> where that was supposed to go. And anyway, but, but I fixed that and made it work, and it was fun. Um, and so then the next game was Gotcha. And the next, next game Atari put out, they actually put out Pong Doubles, but I won't mention that because it's just another version of Pong. But then they put out this game called Gotcha. And this is, again, super unique. Uh, came out in, now we're up to the fall of 1974. Uh, it was the first maze game ever made. Two players chase each other through a maze. Um, it's kind of infamous, though, for other reasons. It's infamous for the controllers. Um, I don't, you can't see them very well there, but I'll, here, I'll zoom in for you. <laughs> um, there was a guy here early, earlier at the Art of Atari. If you were at Art of Atari, I asked a question at the, in the q and I asked if he had worked on this cabinet, because he said he had been there since 72, and this came out in 74, and he, and he denied any involvement. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, so, yeah. So, but somebody had the idea to encase the joysticks in pink rubber domes to make the game more provocative or interesting. <laughs> anyway, so this was not only the first maze game in history, it was actually the first controversial game in history. It got banned places, um, and, uh, and, and they later had to take the domes off and just use regular joysticks to be able to get it into more family-friendly venues. Um, but, so I'm reading, so like each one of these, I, I would go online and I would read everything I could online about the thing that I'm going to work on, right? And so now I'm, I'm searching gotcha, and there's not very much stuff about Atari gotcha at all, you know? But one of the things I find is this super interesting article. What was the first true color video game? And it goes back and it starts like, well, some people think it's Galaxian, they're totally wrong, and they go earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier until he gets to gotcha. And he says, there's some evidence that there was a color version of gotcha. And there's two games, Wimbledon and gotcha, and they both came out around November 1974, and one of them must be the very first color arcade game in history. And I'm like, really? The very first color arcade game in history no one knows what it is. Really? No one knows what it is when it came out. There's no pictures online of Color Gotcha. So I'm searching Color Gotcha. Again, you know, I encourage you to Google it. Other than my article will come up and very few other things will come up. The only other things that will come up will say this might exist. 
So anyway, I'd read that and I'm like, okay, fine, you know, interesting. But I'm looking for a gotcha PCB. A gotcha PCB comes up. Uh, it just happens. I, I didn't realize how lucky I was at the time that this this Southern California um, guy who had a friend who was an operator back in the day just started putting up a bunch of old boards. And he puts one whole set up of boards, and I'm like, buy it now, buy it now, buy it now. They're like 39 bucks. I'm like, buy it now, buy it now, buy it now, buy it now. And then the next one he puts up, he takes off the buy it now, you know. <laughs> you know but I'm like bidding. I get about half. I don't get the shark one. It's oh, <laughs> Man eater, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. So, but anything like 70, pre-75, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to win this, uh, <laughs> you know, because um, I'm working my way through history. Um, and um, so he puts up a gotcha, I buy it. And then his next batch of words comes up and he puts this up. And, and I don't know if you can see it up in the top there, what that says. It <laughs> says color gotcha. And I'm like, no way. How can this be color gotcha? But this, there's, there's a, online, I had seen the schematic for this daughter board. See, they had taken the black and white gotcha and then they had modified it, hooked this daughter board on the side, and this is the part that generates the color signal. And the color comes out, this little, this little thing here. So it really looked right. Um, it even had this little tag on it that said color gotcha. And so this was um, around March of this year. And March is when all the game developers get together at this conference called Game Developers Conference. And so I'm running around Game Developers Conference going, you won't believe like this thing is on eBay right now. I'm like, don't bid on it. I'm going to bid on it. But I'm like so excited about it. I can't like contain myself. Like every time I run into somebody re retro related, I'm like, let me tell you what's going on. I don't know why I'm telling you this. <laughs> so anyway. What happens is, um, me and one other guy, basically, in the world know what this is. <laughs> and he's not one of the guys I talked to at, at GDC, but, um, but we both bid it up relatively high. Uh, it was less than $1,000, I'll say that. <laughs> it was a lot for a printed circuit board. Um, but I won, because I really wanted to win. <laughs> and. Um, and so yeah, so this thing came, and so so then I, I and, you know, so I post. I'm so excited. I, I post this on Facebook. Excited to be receiving a very rare PCB for the color version of the Atari game. Gotcha, 1973. Oh, I said 74 before. I meant I meant 73. I'm sorry. 71 computer space, 72 pong, 73 gotcha. Take back all the 74s I said earlier. I should get this right. Um, 1973. This is like this is literally the fifth game from Atari, right? It's a fourth or fifth game. I mean, it's super, super early that that first color game would be that early. I think it's kind of amazing. So anyway, I post this on Facebook. I have I have some Facebook friends, and one of them. Oh, and and it's like my kids. My kid is like at like you know one of those bouncy places where the trampoline. He's like at there at his birthday, and I'm I've got to go pick him and some other kids up to take him to his birthday. I really quick type this up, hit return, post it. I'm driving down to pick him up. And I'm like, check my Facebook, and, it's, and I have this posted on my Facebook. <laughs> Nolan Bushnell, okay, he's saying, it's, first of all, Nolan, really, you, wa you watch my Facebook page? <laughs> but second of all, you know, so this is like, now I'm worried, because I spent a lot of money on this board. And here's like the guy who should know. But the thing about Nolan is, his, his stories haven't all proven to be true. And his, his memory has not proven to be that great. Anyway, so I'm juggling kids and I'm trying to get a response up and it's like, you know, real life and this craziness. And I'm like, so I try to write something to say, hey, I think this is really the footage. I think it is. And then he's like, oh yeah, 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 you're right, you're right. So anyway, so I was like, okay, that's good. So. So I've got a black and white gotcha, and I've got a color gotcha. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, first I'm gonna fix the black and white gotcha. I'm gonna get that working. And it had a few problems, uh, but I was able pretty, pretty quickly able to track them down. I think it didn't have to do a lot of work to it, and I got black and white gotcha working. Uh, I'm like, all right, I'm ready to go to color gotcha, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go in steps, because this stuff is so 
hard and complicated. I try to do little steps every time. I try to fix one little thing. I try to go one little step at a time. Um, and so I'm like, okay, I'm going to get the black and white part of the color board working, and then I'll get the color part of the color board working. So I try to do that, and I try and I try, and I cannot get the black. The black, there's no, the sync signal is totally screwed up. The TV is just rolling. It just looks like garbage. And finally, I track it down to there's a couple cut traces on the board that were clearly purposely cut as part of the modification to make this a color board. And I realized that there's no way I'm going to be able to make this work as a black and white card. OK, fine. I'll just go to color. So then I go to hook up the color. And I hook it up to a monitor, and it looks like that. And that's also bad. <laughs> and see, sometimes, because I really am learning as I go, there's basic stuff that I don't understand. And usually, if there's like one basic thing I don't understand, I can like read on cloth and I can do research and things. But every once in a while, there'll be like two things I don't understand will come together. And then it's really hard. <laughs> there's like two things I don't know happening at once. And that was sort of what was going on here. And basically, the two things that I didn't know were one, I didn't, which the arcade people will laugh at me, but I didn't know this. I'm new to this. I didn't understand that there was, there was negative sync and positive sync. And that they're different. And that monitors that you have to put a positive sync into a positive sync monitor, or at least the positive sync part of the monitor, and negative sync. So that's one thing I didn't understand at the time. And the second thing I didn't understand was, was something called open collector. Okay? And there's, there are certain chips that are called open collector chips. You're nodding your head. I'm sure you understand it better than I do. But the key thing from my point of view is you have to have a pull down resistor after the open collector chip. Pull up, I'm sorry, see, there you go, pull up, pull up resistor, um, or you will not get a signal out of this chip. And so I could track the video signal coming into this chip, and then it would not come out. And there were no pull up resistors on that board. And so presumably, it's because they were, again, soldering straight into a monitor, and or into a TV, and the TV it's gonna be at, the other end. at that part must have had the equivalent, right? So anyway, it took me a while to figure it out. Uh, that's where the pull up, well, that's the, the open collector part of it. It's just an inverter chip just before it goes out. Um, you know, hooking it into the back of my Scrabble cabinet was difficult. <laughs> I'm trying to debug this. So I ended up getting this old IBM monitor that I had sitting around anyway on my IBM XT and, and, and uh, making a connector to that. And it turns out that that was helpful because it can accept both positive and negative things which helped me get over one of the two problems. Um, and then uh, talking to my brother about uh, open collector chips, and <laughs> uh, that helped me get over the other problem. But basically, I, I got this, I, I, in this image, I'm just jumpering over the video signal over the chip, basically, to get it out, to create that. Um, and then I plug it in on my Robotron, <laughs> and it looks like that, which is still bad. Um, but then I use a little proto board, and I make a, um, Basically, I, I'm going to need to invert all the signals, um, and uh, so that's just a little uh, TTL chip that uh, knots the signals coming through it. And in, rather than using, uh, I wasn't sure what value to use for my pull-up resistor. I ended up putting a variable resistor in there, and just that way I could tweak the value uh, to get it to work the way I wanted. Um, and I got this image, and I was really excited because. I'm pretty sure I was the first person to see the first color arcade game in a long time, maybe 30 years or something. Uh, so it was really cool to see that. Uh, and I had been uh, talking to this guy named Kurt Bendel, who uh, wrote the book on Atari. Uh, and I sent him that image. And uh, his book is called Atari Business is Fun. Uh, and, uh, he sent me this. He said, here's a picture from an unpublished brochure from 1974. Uh, here's Nolan Bushnell. And look at the image below. <laughs> and there it is. It matches, my, matches the image that I had on my screen. So um, anyway, super exciting. Uh, here's a video of it in action. Uh, the sort of more pattern that you see is just interference from the iPhone <laughs> trying to film it. Uh, 
doesn't actually look like that, but the game works. It, uh, and uh, and there you go. When I posted that blog entry, it was the very first entry of uh, the very first images, uh, still images and moving images of the very first color of cake game. Um, through Kurt and some other people, I went on to, to prove that, uh, that it was, in fact, the, the first game that it came out a month before the game called Wimbledon. Um, or at least I present a bunch of evidence in the blog that that's the case. So, anyway, really fun, really cool, really exciting to be part of that, of that project. <laughs> um, I'm almost done. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take questions in a minute, but I just before I, I go, I, I want to, uh, you know, I want to plead to the collectors that are out there that they, that this is an important part of our heritage that is going away very quickly. Um, mach these machines, if they're not taken care of, they rot and fall apart. Or people just throw them out. Um, I had to rescue a, an Atari uh, anti-aircraft the other day, which is uh, not that far in the future of this. And it was posted on, on Craigslist in Seattle, and they just kept lowering the price. Lowering the price, lowering the price. And when it got down to $150, I was like, Fine, I'll take, you know, bring it to me. Because I know the next thing is they're just going to throw it away. You know? But there aren't very many of these out there. Collectors should be all over this stuff. I mean, it's, it, it's really the very beginnings of the arcade business. Um, and anyway, I just think it's really important. So um, thank you for listening to my talk. Um, I will, um, I'm going to show you a couple other projects that I'm working on that I haven't written up yet on the blog, and then I'm going to take questions, okay? All right. Uh, I've, I have this, I've been actually between when I did the computer space and when I did uh, Color Gotcha, I actually spent a bunch of time on Space War. And because the very first arcade game I wrote on the 800 in assembly language was Space War. And so it has a lot of meaning to me and there's a whole long story about me trying to get enough parts together for a space war, and there were two different people involved, and I could only get some parts from some. Anyway, I have a long write-up I need to do around space war, but anyway, that's going to happen. I finally have the cabinet now. I can finally put the guts that I had to fix into the cabinet. But then I stumbled on a vector beam space war, and so <laughs> I had to get that. And another machine, because somebody was selling a storage locker full of machines that they had gotten storage wars fashion. Somebody had bought somebody's storage locker and didn't know anything about it and just put it up on Craigslist. Is that the one with the Sinistar cockpit? Oh, sure. Wrecked my punchline at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yes, is the answer. So anyway, uh, got the space war, uh, went through some effort to fix it, but since I had been working on uh, the cinematronic space wars, uh, I, it wasn't too bad. I knew how to fix it. Um, so I'm gonna, I want to write up a big thing about that. I did have a chance to get a Wimbledon. This came down from Vancouver Island. It's beautiful. It has like 28 plays on the, on the coin counter. It's, I feel guilty every time I like push the little thing. You know, now, it's, now it says 29. It's like, it, it, it's basically brand new out of the warehouse. And this is super, super rare. Um, Van Burnham, if you know who she is, she is, I was down visiting her. Uh, she runs a thing called Super K down in Pasadena. Uh, and I was telling her that this thing had been for sale and I wasn't sure if I should get it. She's like, get it. It's like, if you, if you don't take it, I will. So I'm like, fine. I'll, I'll get it, and then I'll ship it down to Van. And the guy shows up with this thing, and it's just completely unused. Uh, 1973, second color arcade game ever made. Anyway, so I'm keeping it. <laughs> um, you know, anti-aircraft, I told you about that. Uh, needs some cabinet restoration, which is not my favorite thing, but, um, but I fixed the game, it's working, so that's good. This is the project I'm working on right now, Grand Track 10. I, I can't wait to write about this game. Uh, huge amount of history around this. This was the first true racing game. It uh, has a, a bunch of other firsts. It has the, it's, I believe it's the first video game with custom uh, ICs in it. Um, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's well known to be the first game with a ROM chip in it. Um, 
And I have everything working but the sound. I did pretty well this week. I got, got a lot working on this machine this week. Uh, and then, yeah, so this came from a friend who was moving out of his warehouse and had a bunch of extra games he didn't know what to do with. And he's like, he wants some of them. And so he gave me a bunch of his old stuff. So he gave me that. He gave me you know, a super bug that's busted. And he gave me an XED Destruction Derby, which is not quite Death Race. but. Uh, <laughs> But those, so those are sitting downstairs in the garage waiting to, for their turn for me to work on. Um, he also gave me a Defender, which I don't, didn't really want, but I have a friend who's super good at Defender, and I said, I'll just fix it up for him real quick. So I, I got it working for him, and it's heading out the door. Um, and then, yeah, like I said, this, the SimStar, which the SimStar is being difficult so far. <laughs> I, it's, got a, it's got a Wells Gardner 4600 vertical mount monitor. But it, it didn't come with a monitor. I took a horizontal and I rotated it. And, but I, I couldn't get a WG4600 vertical mount, so I put it in a different mount and I screwed it up. And anyway, and then I got a dip, anyway. It's a whole long story. But I'm, I'm making progress. But it's not there yet. Uh, all right, that's it. No more. Okay, so there you go. I, I guess I guess the bottom line for me is just to encourage people to do this stuff and not to be afraid. It's, it seems intimidating. I, I, fine, I've done a bunch of software stuff. I know zero about hardware, or at least I did when I started. I've, I've, I've learned as I w I've gone along. There's a lot of information online. And if you just take your time and work at it, you can figure stuff out. And it's super, super rewarding. Really, really fun. So uh, that's the bottom line for me. Now I'm happy to take any questions people have. Yeah. Uh, I know your background wasn't really in electrical engineering, but uh, what are some of the resources, uh, well, really non-academic uh, resources that you uh, went to to really learn before just making a ton of expensive mistakes? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, other than calling my brother, <laughs> which I mention a few times in my blog when I get desperate, um, you know, one of the things that's amazing that's out there are the, the early manuals that go along with these games. Now, computer space, there's no good manual for it. Um, but if you just go a little bit farther forward, like that grand track, which is only, that, there you're 1974. Um, they break down every little part of the schematic into little pieces. You just go to Claw and download the, the manual that's there, and they'll be like, here's the sync circuit, here's how it works, and there'll be a few paragraphs. Here's the part that handles when a coin is put in, and here's how it works. And it just goes through section by section by section, and you can really learn how one of these TTL games was put together just by reading those manuals. It's, it's actually kind of fun, I think, to read. Uh, and so, so there's that. I mean, the basic, the basic skills to do it are, are not that hard. I have a variable temperature soldering iron. I, I have a desoldering iron. Um, I, I just bought a decent oscilloscope, which I use more for the monitors than the, than the boards. But before that, I had a little, just this, this little oscilloscope that plugs into a laptop. But actually having an actual oscilloscope is, is really nice because it has this auto button on it. You can just push auto and it, <laughs> and it turns all the knobs for you and gives you the right signal. Um, and so even debugging these monitors, which is a little frightening because you could kill yourself in theory. Um, but the actual work is not that bad as long as you try not to kill yourself. I mean, just like following, you know, put an input signal in and then just follow it through the circuit until it doesn't come out the other side of something. The last few that I've done, it's always been a pot. So a little variable uh, resistor. They look like little knobs. When they're 40 years old, sometimes they just don't work anymore. Um, and so replacing the pot, sometimes even just twisting the pot and unsticking it and cleaning the pot will, will fix it. Um, but you know, it'll go into a transistor and not come out of the transistor. You go, hmm, okay. The, the last two uh, black and white monitors I did, it both came down to a, um, and that was the, the 23 inch, it's called a Motorola 701. It's in, I mean, again, I go online, you can find the Motorola 701 repair manual, which is written for TV repair guys. Um, it's easy to find, and then you can just go through it. Again, it's, it's not that hard. Um, anyway, it just goes to a capacitor that's clearly shorted. These electrolytic capacitors are well known from collectors. They're often bad. 
So, so I track it down to this bad capacitor. I replace the capacitor. It works great. Then I go to work on the second one, and I'm like, hmm, I wonder. And I check the same capacitor. It's shorted too. I replace it, and it works too. And it's like, there you go. It's just not so bad. So I just, you know, I just encourage people to, to play and learn, and um, don't electrocute yourself. If you do, it's not my fault. Yeah, I, I'm trying to restore a Fairchild Channel F home console yeah. and uh, actually put a you know, composite video mod on it so you can use it on you know basically an HD TV. Yeah, that that sounds cool. I have I have a Channel F myself. Um, if you know if, if schematics aren't available, it's going to be a lot harder. Like I, there's almost no information about Wimbledon online. There's no Wimbledon schematics. I'm glad the one I have is new and working because um, it it would be more challenging if I didn't have that. What other questions? Yeah. Uh, how, how much time did you say you spent getting the color adoption work? Yeah, I mean. Full hard figure. So I call these procrastination projects. So what I mean by that is like when I'm supposed to be doing other stuff, which is pretty much all the time, I work on these instead. You know, um, So it's hard to sort of account for my time. But it's sort of my hobby when I'm trying to avoid doing real work. Um, the color gotcha, I would say maybe 40 hours total spread out across a couple months, something like that. Um, one problem is I'm like getting better at it. I'm getting faster at it, which is cool, but it gives me less to write about. Like when I'm writing about it, I guess like, oh, I'm stuck here. I don't know why. It's like, oh, here's how a transistor works. You know, now, now it's like it's almost like I've learned too much, and now I can't I can't help people as much in my writing because it's like, oh yeah. So I fixed the monitor, and then, you know. um, but yeah, it you know it's just it's just a fun thing to do when you have spare time. That's how I do that. What other questions? Yeah. Okay, you're, you're progressive through the years. How far are you going <laughs> to I mean, I, I mean, I think one, one thing that any collector needs to do is to put like boundaries around their collecting. Like I started collecting some games, right? And it's like, OK, I want to collect all the EA flats for Atari. Okay. And I worked on that for a couple of years on eBay until I got all the Atari EA flats, which some people know what that is, some people don't. But they're early EA games that look like record albums. They're really cool uh, to collect. Um, you know, I want to collect all the Infocom gray boxes for Atari. But, you know, like have a bunch of like restrictions around it. So this is kind of the same thing. It's like, it's like, OK, I'm going to do pre-1975 black and whites. You know, but then a Sinistar cabinet shows up, which is super rare. You know, and it's in the same storage unit as the vector beam space war that you really want. You know, it's like, OK, I, I got to buy that. <laughs> so I think it's you know, space, money, other lines that you can put around it. But it's, it's easy to get sucked in. It's easy to get sucked in. Yeah. How many are cabinets? Uh, yeah, out of time. Okay, I'm out of time. Uh, but I'll, I think I can answer that one last question. I was thinking about that earlier. I don't have that many. With the new ones the friend brought over, I have about 10. And I have probably that many, again, PCBs uh, that don't match games that I have. Uh, but like that Grand Track, I have I had two Grand Track 10 motherboards, PCBs, and then the game came with two, so then I had four. Well, and then I found out that none of them are actually Grand Track 10; they're all Formula K. And now, so now I'm and, and now so it looks like no one's ever dumped the, the Grand Track 10 wrong. I could I have not so far been able to find it. And all the four Grand Tracks that I have are all Formula K Grand Tracks, not Grand Track 10. So this is the very first ROM in a video game, and no one's dumped it, really? <laughs> well, the, the track is really distinctive. If you look, it's in the Formula K track is more complicated. I could, you could just, if you Google image, you'd, you'd see it in a second. But anyway. Um, 
So I think that's interesting. There's a lot of work to be done around these really early machines to document them. And I think it's super cool. Anyway, I'm out of time. I got to go. Thank you, guys.